Don't miss the chance to get inside the minds of the top marketing leaders and creators at Variety's Entertainment Marketing Summit, presented by Deloitte, on May 24. This day-long conference explores the industry's constantly evolving brand and content strategies, featuring insightful speakers like Hulu President Joe Early, Dakota Johnson, Aisha Curry, and top marketing visionaries from Spotify, Google, Netflix, WWE, HBO, TikTok, and the Super Bowl champions, Los Angeles Rams. Take your career to the next level and form connections that will last far beyond the event. Seating is limited and tickets will go fast, so visit Variety.com slash Marketing Summit and register today. From Variety, celebrating more than 115 years covering the business of entertainment, this is the Award Circuit Podcast. It felt very cathartic Um, because, of course, it's been a huge part of my life. It's been an enormous part of my life. Being cast as Loki changed the course of my life. That moment is a fork in the road. I can't go back there and I don't particularly want to, but it just is. uh, It has been very meaningful. And to get to that point of playing that scene. For Tom Hiddleston, the scene in Disney Plus's Loki, where he sees his life play out, was tremendously meaningful. I'm Michael Schneider, and on this edition of the Variety Awards Circuit Podcast, Tom Hiddleston discusses both of his recent TV series and Emmy contention, Loki and Apple TV Plus's The Essex Serpent. It's all next on this edition of the Variety Awards Circuit Podcast. Stay close. While most actors would be pleased to be part of one excellent series in a year, Tom Hiddleston has the unique privilege of starring in two. First up was Loki, the smash Marvel property that continued the adventures of the MCU's most popular villain, or a variant thereof, that hit Disney Plus last June. And this May, we'll see the premiere of Apple TV Plus's limited series The Essex Serpent, an adaptation of the acclaimed 2016 Sarah Perry novel set in 1893 in a small village plagued by rumors of a mythical beast. Hitting Apple TV Plus on May 13, The Essex Serpent is a six-part limited series adapted by Anna Simon and directed by Clio Bernard. Claire Danes stars as Cora Seaborn, a widow who moves with her son to a small village that may be haunted by this legendary beast. Hiddleston plays the town vicar, Reverend Will Ransom, who clashes with Cora over their differing beliefs. You let them accuse me. You said nothing. I'm their pastor. So you can't be my friend and a man of God. I can't think clearly when I'm around you. I won't be blamed for your weakness. Love is not a weakness. I think the Essex Serpent has sunk its claws into you, too. It feels like a new sort of role for Hiddleston, who plays a husband and father, a man of faith looking to protect and unite his community, rather than an agent of chaos. The actor also jumped at the chance to work with Danes, who made an impact on him at a young age in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Hiddleston says he's had good luck with co-stars in chemistry and that it sometimes comes from going through a new experience together, like the time he was cast in Thor or falling off horses during training. Variety's Janelle Riley recently spoke to Hiddleston about both shows, having a milestone birthday during the pandemic and more. He also took part in a quiz where he had to guess between the characters of Shakespeare and Marvel. Janelle began by having a little fun with Tom. So actually, here's the thing. I printed out questions for today, and then I realized that they were actually from my last interview with someone else. Uh. But the good news is it was (laughs) Kenneth Branagh. Okay. Yes, so would you be okay if I just asked all the questions I was going to ask him? Sure. Okay. So my first (laughs) question is, why didn't you cast Tom Hiddleston in Belfast? (laughs) I don't know. Well, um, Ken, what do you think? Well, Tom, um, uh, oh, I don't know. Sweet. There's no part for me in Belfast, surely. There's He's not no. been the dad. No, but Jamie's perfect. He's sure. you no. Know, he's from the area. It's he's a local boy. Um, no, nothing. There's nothing for me to do there. It was a perfect film. Um, who could I have played? No one. I could have played maybe some sort of ruffian in the in the gang. Maybe but, you could have uh, played the young boy. You could uh, pull that off. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he great? He was Wasn't he wonderful. Did you, I'm sure you did, but did you catch he was reading Thor comics? Yes. Of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. That's like the big... Is that one of the moments when it's in color? No, it's not quite. No, no. But yeah. I thought I was very clever until I realized everyone caught that. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really sweet, that. It's very real, I think. 
Yeah. It's a very real yeah, memory that he has. Movie. Yeah. Um, I, I loved it. I actually do have a question that applies to both of you. Okay. Because we were talking about how he's the first person to be nominated in like seven different categories at the Oscars. That's right. And you both are Record known. breaker. Yeah. And you guys can sing and act and do all sorts of things. <laughs> so what are you bad at? So many things to know. No. Maths, um, uh, um, cricket, um, <laughs> painting, drawing. Um, no, see, you're not. Remember, you won the drawing contest when you the, all had to draw your characters. So I knew you would try uh, and claim that, okay. and you literally cannot <laughs> okay, say yeah. that. Yep. It's loads of stuff. I'm bad at <laughs> so many things. Isn't, life is a weird... Um, do you, do you ever think that when you're young, it, you kind of are drawn, you're drawn to the things, you're, it's hard to keep doing the things that don't come naturally, maybe? Oh, yeah. I thought, like, it, this sounds terrible, but writing always came easy to me. Right. And it's hard now, and it yeah. scares me. Yeah, that's Like, what if I lose that? Yeah. It's, you find it hard to write now? Harder. You mean yeah. the the process of the flow or, or just yeah. inspiration? Or? And like jokes used to come to me like that. I mean, maybe not good ones, but they, they came. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, do you ever worry with that with acting? It, I think there's something really good about, they say like, there's something very beneficial to the mind about learning lines and keeping, it keeps the mind, the neuroplasticity stretchy and it keeps you, um, keeps your mind young, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I hope to be one of those actors who's, um, it keeps you playful, I think. And you keep having to learn things, skills, stories, people. It makes you pay attention, which is good. I actually wondered about that because obviously we're coming out of two very strange years with the pandemic, during which you also turned 40. Yes. Which is, yes. is crazy. Yes, I did. And so, <laughs> and so see, you see, you, you see it sort of sadly, but I No, no, it was great. I loved it. It was yeah. great, actually. Yeah. It was great. It, it felt very meaningful. It still does. Um, being in your 40s is different from being in your 30s, isn't it? And your 20s. Yeah, the passing of time. Sound in the hourglass. More in the bottom than at the top. Who knows? Um, but it's a midpoint, isn't mm -hmm. it? I remember, I remember thinking, I'll be, I'll count myself fortunate if I get another forty, and that's definitely a. It crystallizes things in your mind, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I'm 27. <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. Okay, of yeah. Course. <laughs> but they've been a good forty as well. You know, I had a, I had a been, I've been so lucky, and you know. It's been, a, it's been certainly been an adventure. It, it, it made me as reflective as I predicted it would make me actually. Yeah. Um, it is a hugely reflective time. And I yeah. always think for artists, it's, it's such an interesting time. And then especially I had the pandemic on top of that. And you're probably doing all this reflecting. Does it, did it change the way that you look at the roles you want to choose, the ones you want to do, or maybe that had happened before that? Mm, good question. Um, only insofar as I'm just really aware of the value of time. I think I always have been, but if you, I would, I suppose it's, I, I definitely know that I, my preference, if I, if I had one would be to go to, to make choices, which would allow me to go deeply into things. Depth is something that's very, um, I'm feel, feel drawn to as an explore an idea really deeply as opposed to, I mean, maybe everyone would prefer that prefer depth to shallowness in some way. So maybe it's a strange metaphor, but maybe there was a time when you were, when I was, I think young, when I was younger, it was easy to, uh, to go, yeah, I'll try this. Yeah. You know, I'll give it a go. Like, and you kind of give things a go because, you don't want to look back and feel like you missed an opportunity. You know, you're more inclined to new experiences, although I'm still inclined to new experiences. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't worked out how I think about it. Really. <laughs> um, but I'm definitely more thoughtful about what I choose to do for sure. And I, and I suppose the last couple of things have been very deliberate choices to go to commit to these quite big projects and long projects and go into them very deeply and really commit to them and that be the thing that I do for six months or eight months I mean Loki was supposed to be <laughs> like, <laughs> not two years yeah yeah exactly <laughs> ended up being a two, big two-year job so 
I uh, ask because we're here to talk about the Essex Serpent, obviously. Yeah, By yeah. the way, as someone with a lisp, the Essex Serpent feels like an attack on me. <laughs> I'm so I sorry. <laughs> and then I was trying to, the yeah. last night I was trying to say it by Sarah Perry. By, the Essex Serpent by Sarah Perry. Yeah. Say that quickly five times. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots. It's, yeah. Um, but I, I, you've played so many roles, and yet I don't know if I've seen a role like Will Ransom before. For, for starters, you're a father. Yeah, I know. For, yeah, yeah, first father, yeah. You're a vicar. Yep. Um, a man of faith who, but is also like really trying to help people, trying yes. to keep things together yes. instead of trying to tear them apart. Yes, like yes. Yeah, like other people. Other people. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I guess maybe that's, I just was really drawn to it. I was drawn to him. I was drawn to, he's so finely drawn by Sarah Perry and by Anna Simon um, in the screenplays and, and, he seems to be a very, he seems to be kind of similar to a literary archetype, very um, grounded, very solid, very rational, a container for other people's anxieties, someone that people lean on and depend on. Um, but of course, he doesn't have all the answers and and there are things he hasn't folded into his theology and his uh, worldview and actually i found that really interesting is is um as someone who seems like he has it all figured out um you know the serpent the essex serpent in his mind is is uh some hidden truth that he hasn't integrated into his way of seeing the world um and that seemed like a really interesting thing to explore i suppose I mean, it's such a beautiful story, and yeah. it has all these big themes. There's science, faith, feminism, yeah. really, with yeah. Claire as character. Yes. It is literally a show that doesn't lend itself to a 20-second elevator pitch. And right. yet, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, okay. because this is actually seconds. airing before anyone has seen it. Yes. Yeah, if you if you could, wait, I'm going to time this. No, I won't really do that. We can do. <laughs> okay, do you want me to time right, it? Let's see, I've got it right here. Have you got it? Okay, give me and... a countdown. The Blackwater Estuary on the easternmost east coast of England. A teenage girl has gone missing. Something is bumping into the fishing boats. Is there something beneath the surface of the water? A winged dragon from folklore come back to uh, haunt you. Um, The monster that you're scared of when the middle of the night lies to you. A widow uh, in search of meaning. A vicar who thinks he has it figured out. A story of passion and intrigue and mystery. uh, Full of gothic... Um, opacity and uh, a, a debate between faith and reason. What do you think that came in at? I think it was about 25. <laughs> it was 33. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and no, I, overs- I was good at the beginning and then I... Yeah. No, but that was great. I would watch it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I already have, so I'm yeah. shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you, I was talking about how you're always part of these amazing ensembles, whether it's the Marvel movies or, you know, Night Manager or Muppets, of course. Of course. Um, your the Muppets. main scene partner here is Claire Danes, yeah. who is so fantastic. And it, re- it the, the, the show, it's about a lot of things, but it hinges so much on your chemistry. And I'm always curious, like, did you know each other beforehand? Or is no, it, not, not, so not at all, me. really. Yeah. Um, there's a connection with, uh, there is a l- lovely connection through Josie Rourke, um, the director, um, who is and has is an old friend of her husband's, um, so that was a nice connection to make. But we hadn't really ever, yeah, we hadn't really met and and interacted at all. So, um, but it was really quick and easy actually. She's so bright in every way, so intelligent and playful and and um, engaged and fun and spirited and and committed I, she's such a committed actor um and she's been doing it for so long and she's had so many different experiences and she's a very strong i think a very strong person and has a very bright spirit and it's got lots of range and i think all the range is in her performance as cora um but we we did <laughs> I, I whenever i think of my relationship with claire on the set it was always i became a cliche of an Englishman in terms of trying to advertise that better weather was to come. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> every day I would say, it's Claire, I know it's cold today and it's windy and it's wet, but believe me, when the sun comes out, it's going to be really beautiful. And the sun would never come out. And then occasionally it would come out and I would try and sort of, I'd say, look at this, look where we are, isn't it magical? And she was like, keep trying, Tom. 
Um, but uh, she's married to a Brit. She knows. She gets it. She, she understands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but there was a kind of um, we were thrown together in this phase of the pandemic. I'm not quite sure what the situation was in the states or, or in or here where we are in in California, but there was a, a third winter lockdown, and it started in started around Christmas time, and I, I think it finished in June. And it was, it felt like the hardest one, I think, mm. because it was winter and it was January and it was cold and it was happening again. And um, we started prepping in late January, early February, and we went and started filming in Essex in March. And there was some freedom or, or there felt like there was some release in being outside. It was cold, it was wet, it was windy, but we were outside the science would tell you that there was a very low chance of, of the transmissibility of the virus. And, and, um, and so in, in a way we kind of formed this, this bubble of, of wind and mud and Essex and being on the coast and kind of, it was nice. It was a, a nice bubble to be in. I could think of worse places to be. I just always think it's so strange to like put two virtually strangers yeah. together and then say, okay, have chemistry. Yeah. And what do you do if you don't? I mean, I guess that's where acting comes in. Right. Yeah. And I've never, I very rarely, I mean, I can't think of a time when I have felt that, but we did somehow find, um, find that we just, we kind of just understood each other. It was really nice. It was really, um, it was really playful. It was really fun. Um, and, and maybe it's the, sometimes you have to be in an experience together, which is new. And so the newness of the experience is what actually creates the chemistry because no one else is, is learning this new thing or going through it with you. So, I mean, I remember when Chris Hemsworth and I met for the first time, we were just like at the beginning of this adventure, kind of like sitting next to each other on a roller coaster and not knowing where the ride was going. And the fact that it was just the two of us on the ride, I kind of created something between us. And when I met Benedict Cumberbatch for the first time, we were training for like to, to ride as cavalry officers and war horse and, and horses are so honest and <laughs> they don't care who's riding them really. But so, yeah, but so we fell off and, you know, and learned. Wait, to, you fell off the horses? Yeah. Well, well I, there was a, I fell off once when I was, or oh, I was on a runaway once a, a horse got scared and ran back to the stables and it was quite, so you just, you make mist you know, when you're learning something new and I, it was a real thing of like the two of us got to know each other because we were doing this new thing together. And I, I think Essex and um, the physical kind of the context of, of the landscape and the tide coming in and going out and falling over in the mud and being caught in these extraordinary winds and um, these genuinely breathtaking skies, the sunsets and, and just trying to get through it and, and communicate the material. And it kind of created a, a, a bon on me, I suppose. Um, that was really nice. You're doing that thing again where you use a word that I'm not sure I understand <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or yeah. that I probably know and I've just mis 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 I learned from you. I've been mispronouncing several times. <laughs> Sorry. Bonhomie. Bonhomie, yeah. Bonhomie, I think, is a French word, I guess, um, meaning a good humor. Oh, okay. I have been mispronouncing it. All right. Bon, how would you pronounce it? Bon am I. Bon am I, yeah. You want to laugh at me so bad <laughs> no, right I now. Don't. You're too polite no, to. No, I appreciate no. it. Bon ami. Bon ami. I don't know how you'd say it in a, with a French person, but, you know, it's like a, a lightness of, I don't know, a lightness of spirit, maybe. A bon ami. But it, maybe it's something that you share, right? I, I've already I forgotten. I've you taught me how to say Tom's. No, I just mispronounced it, didn't I? Tam's. <laughs> It's, yes. been, it's been like 12 yes. hours sorry, I've sorry. already forgotten. Yes, te it's a weird one. Ah, uh, forgive me. I went Thames. to an American No, 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 no. School. Please don't. Come on. It's <laughs> it's, a, it's a river. It's it's in London. And, you know, why should you know how? You know, English is confusing. There are silent letters in it. And, you know, um, yes, Thames. 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 It should be almost. How would you spell Thames? T-E-M-M-S. There you go. All right. Can you spell? Speak to somebody at the dictionary okay, okay. about that. Yeah. There is a place called Tame as well, which is confusing. Really? I wonder, I'm in just going to pretend like that's what I was doing yeah. all along. Maybe the Thames goes through Tame. It oh, must, no. There must be some relationship No, that's too there. much for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I know. The Thames, the River Thames. Just so anyone listening, we're talking about the River Thames in London. Um, I just I just wonder how often I have been mispronouncing words my entire life and just never had anyone intelligent enough to say it correctly. But I mispronounce me. words all the time. Mm, do you though? Yeah, yeah. I remember that she was once I um, mispronounced a word in English class once at school. I felt so embarrassed because I knew what it meant and I just never said it out loud. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I actually think anyway. you might have mispronounced Thanos the other day. Did I? You, you, it was, or maybe it just came out. Did I say Thanos? No, it was like, it had like a strong A. Like, like Thanos? Yeah. Than- maybe I was trying, because I would say Thanos. Right. But then I know that in the States, people say Thanos. So maybe I was trying to do that. Or I probably completely misheard, which is possible. You know, it comes from the Greek for death, which is Thanatos. I didn't know that, but of course you do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, than- Thanatos. It's uh... It's, it's death in Greek, ancient Greek. And I you're think. trying to tell me you're not well read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I've read some books once. Yeah. Um, I was thinking because I'm just such, I'm so in awe of Claire Danes. And you've obviously worked with just this cast. Your, your whole cast is amazing. Yeah. But she is amazing. She's, um, yeah. she's like otherworldly. Yeah. And, she, and, she's got, and she's got this amazing facility. Um, she's so practiced, but she's so spontaneous as well it's like I as I say she's been doing it for so long and um is so brilliant at it it's so uh it's has is so careful and so rigorous but really really free and truthful um yeah I'm just curious if for some reason people have been asking me a lot lately if I ever get nervous Mm. going on stage and I'm like Court, like every single time. Yeah. And I always wonder for actors, like, do you, with all the people you've worked with, do you ever have those moments where you're like, oh my God, I'm acting opposite Claire Danes yeah. or Anthony Hopkins? Yeah, definitely. Oh, get yeah, definitely. The first time I was working with Anthony Hopkins, it was that scene in Thor where um, Loki finds out he's adopted and it's a father and son in a very emotional conversation. Um, and I was completely in awe. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing Claire in, in Romeo and Juliet and I was a young man. I was young. I was still at school, I think. And, um, it's such, it made such a profound impact on the, on, on the culture. It was just, it, it still is kind of like a seminal definitive interpretation of that text. I've never seen it. Have you never seen it? This has been a thing lately. Wow. Cause I just interviewed yeah. Errol, Harold Perrineau, yeah, who's in it. Yeah. And it's just, it's, I think that when I was young, I was like, you can't put modern music to Shakespeare. How uh, dare you? And okay. now the irony being that I've actually written plays yes, that, yes, like, yes, that, yes. you know, <laughs> that had crunking in Jane, yeah. Jane Austen. Um, and so, so I literally made a vow like a week ago that I would go back and watch it. It's amazing. Yeah. And I you think were right it, about heat. It so still, to... it still, it still has enormous power. That film, um, partly because of the two perform the two central performances. Um, I mean, of course, in no small part, the, they are so free and so young and so um, passionate and and so open. And I think, and their commitment to the text is so brilliant, and so full. Um, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a, it's an, it's a sort of iconic '90s film. I think. Um, I promise I will watch it within two weeks. Well, you, if you get to talk to Claire, then you can ask her about it. That's that, right. I got to watch it before next week. Actually, right? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's yeah. It's uh, I remember. So that was my. I know there was my so-called life before that, but I I didn't wasn't as aware of it as as you know. Romeo and Juliet was a was a big one for me, and and she's also done. Um, of course, that was I, she'd be sitting next to me going, Tom, don't talk about the work from twenty years ago. She's done so much. She has done so much work. Um, in the intervening years and so many different kinds of things. And th- yeah, there are, I try to, um, I always just try to be respectful of somebody and whoever I'm working with, their process. And you try to create a, a, commu- a way of communicating and a rapport and, and Homeland, of course, as well, which is just, oh you know. God. Yeah, how many Emmys has she, she's won for the, for Homeland? She's won like three or something. Yeah, at, at least because she was yeah. a producer too. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is you know, 
made a made a profound impact on television i think and and the form of television it was such a huge series and she was so good in it so in terms of sort of yeah i maybe i don't know star starstruck is a funny one it's sort of like uh i get starstruck when i meet tennis players yeah you're a big tennis yeah person. well i just i just find elite tennis players extraordinary I don't know quite why, but I think they have to be so skillful and there's something so uh, solitary about, about playing tennis at that level. But it's also very beautiful to watch. And so the people who are the best at it, I just find it really like pleasing. I find it really pleasing to watch. Anyway, it's got more intense as I've got older. After the break, more from Tom Hiddleston. From Los Angeles, this is the Award Circuit Podcast. And we're back. It's the Award Circuit Podcast. I'm Michael Schneider. We're chatting with Loki and the Essex Serpent star Tom Hiddleston. As we return to Janelle Riley's conversation with Hiddleston, the star had just been talking about his love of tennis. Speaking of tennis, I was thinking about how you've done everything from like big budget spectacles to uh you know, something like Essex Serpent, which which actually is is epic in many ways, but also mm. very intimate and very internal. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, is it harder for you to act in those, like, really stark, dramatic scenes or when you're acting opposite a tennis ball? I think it's the same, isn't it? You've got, really? you've got to – well, you've got to try to be truthful. You've got to try – but and so to sort of break that down, try to represent the truth – of that character in that moment. Um, and there's always a leap of imagination. Tennis is a really good analogy, and I've used it before, I think, but you're trying to play a rally with the person on the other side of the net. Um, and the reason I think tennis is a good analogy is because the court is so clearly delineated, right? Mm. The white lines are delineated. You've got to get the ball in, in, the, in the court. But you can choose what spin you put on the ball and you can choose where to put it within the parameters. And so maybe the script is uh, the parameters and the blocking is, uh, or the choreography or something. And then it really, the magic is in the rally between you. And that's when it's this, this um, work is that it's most thrilling for me is, is in the tennis mat is in the, the, the tennis rally with your opposite partner and, and the tennis, I suppose, with Claire was really great because it was just felt very free. We felt like we we knew kind of what the story was, but once Clio Barnard calls action, it's you try to play with each other um, and you know return serve, and it was really enjoyable. Yeah. I much prefer the tennis metaphor to in America, everything is baseball. I see. I and see. I think, yeah. I think tennis well, I suppose, is a way better. I, I suppose metaphor. it's because it's, it's truly interactive. And I genuinely find the joy, the best acting I've ever done, if I've ever done any good acting, is always about, it's because of the person I'm opposite. I truly believe that. And the generosity of another actor, an actor like Claire, who is prepared and and committed to the game of the imagined world that you're in and um that's when I, that's when it's magical because you, because it's like you know as actors the greatest respect you can pay to another actor is to come prepared and and so that you know the parameters and then and then you can really play um it's much less fun if you're not playing tennis and you're kind of playing tennis against a wall <laughs> <laughs> uh, you sort of the wall isn't as uh, spontaneous or and you mean a literal wall not like an actor that feels i mean like uh, sorry yeah 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 because yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, i've seen some of those performances i suppose so. in a way in a way in a way when you're acting opposite um if you're having to imagine something in your external reality that isn't there that is almost like you're having to you're having to imagine how how the other element is is returning the shot as it were is returning the ball um so there's a sort of game of anticipation that you're playing with yourself yeah 
I've ex- overextended this too much. <laughs> you know, if people talk about dancing, it's much better. You know, having a good dance partner. Again, I'm just glad you didn't go to baseball. I appreciate (laughs) it. (laughs) Um, So uh, even though this series feels more timely than ever, like kind of crazy timely, um, even though it's set in, is it 1893? 1893, correct. Um, I feel like I just won a quiz. You did. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. My brain actually (laughs) retained some information. Um, How do you even go about preparing to play, you know, a man of the cloth, 1893? Again, I feel like this is, this is really new territory for you. And how much, if at all, was the book a resource? Huge. I love it. I mean, I, if there's a book, it's like a gift because- um, certainly the books that I have been, the, the books that have been adapted into production, which I've been in, the books are full of interiority and they're full of, of depth and the inner life of characters, ca- what characters are thinking. So they give you all your subtext. They give you all this inner life that you can kind of attached to and it may be that the uh, interior motivations don't come out in scenes but you know what a character's thinking or or the conflict a character's going through and I felt exactly like that um, I'm trying to think of another example the night manager was a really a really obvious example um, and Sarah Perry's novel of the Essex Serpent was the same um, she gets inside the head of all the characters of, of Cora Seaborn and and Will Ransom and the children as well and Naomi um, and and Frankie and Joe uh, and Stella uh, Will's wife um, and so I found her specific depiction of Will's faith really helpful that um, he really he was really connected to the earth he 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 um, Clio once said, you know, she, that there was a love, he had a great love of nature and his faith or God for him was expressed in, in the majesty and beauty and delicacy of the natural world of the trees and the earth and the ocean and the water. And, you know, um, that he loved being out in nature that it was, he was much more, um, his faith was more natural and grounded than anything high church. And uh, that he was also a progressive intellectual that he would have read Darwin and Lyle. And he would have read, he was curious about the natural sciences and didn't feel, didn't feel his Christian faith was threatened by that. And that uh, God for Will Ransom was really an expression of, of love. Mm. Um, And, um, I found that very moving and it actually allowed me to think about this thing. I think the story is really about is, is um, trying to investigate at great depth where we derive meaning in our lives and playing a, a, a man, a, playing a vicar, a reverend, a parson, a pastor, maybe really consider that. And, and, um, but did a lot of thinking and reading about um, there are some quite ancient ideas in the story about guilt and sin and shame. And Sarah Perry has spoken very eloquently about how she grew up and, and her own relationship to her own faith and, um, and how it had to change because she, there were certain things she just didn't, she couldn't believe were worthy of shame and, mm-hmm. um, and so it's quite revolutionary in a way what she's doing. Um, and I, these are quite big themes. Like the, 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 the there's a great essay about, um, so I read eight years ago, I found somewhere and just some sort of some, some disappearing down some rabbit hole, but about, about guilt in the, in the modern world and how it's, it's, um, easy for any of us to feel guilty about anything, anytime, because we're so aware of, of, um, of the footprint of humanity on the planet. And, and there are so many systems which are out of date and, or have become fragmented and broken and, and you feel complicit in all these systems. And, and, um, but the article was kind of about, uh, how do you talk about guilt without a 
can you talk about guilt without a system of of kind of reparation and forgiveness? How do you atone for your for your quote unquote sin? Um, and this idea of of you know some conception of sin and its opposite as it, and its opposites, virtue, goodness, and where do you how do you locate that in any in your in the in the way you think about the world? Um, and I, I do think the Essex Serpent is about all these things. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, of, co of course, there's the image of the serpent. I think Sarah Perry's chosen it very carefully. Of course, there's a there's a there's a really immediate mystery to to this to the series. There's something in the water. Is there something in the water? Um, something is bumping into the fishing boats. A teenage girl's gone missing. But a serpent is also. There, it was a serpent that tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was, um, you know, uh, a serpent is a slippery, mercurial um, temptation. And if it's, if it's beneath the surface of the water, is that some metaphor for something that lies beneath the surface of our consciousness? Sorry if I'm rambling, but I, I genuinely find <laughs> Well, again, it I always say, everyone's here to hear me talk. <laughs> okay. so you really okay. shouldn't ramble. <laughs> But yeah, a metaphor for the unconscious, I suppose. Um, what lies, what lies underneath the surface? It's interesting though because it it does ask big questions in a very entertaining way. But I feel like everything you do, I feel like even Loki asks these questions. And again, maybe it was you know pandemic viewing where it's like you know what, what paths we could have taken. Yeah, like there could be an alligator me somewhere. There could be. <laughs> or, but it's more about like I think about like all the choices in my life good and bad yeah. that yeah. that have have brought me here mm. and um you know it's it's it, actually is there like is there a variant of you who didn't go into acting and what are they doing I right wonder now? I wonder <laughs> I kept asking that I don't know maybe he would have been a <laughs> a teacher or an academic or something I don't know um I've actually thought about that question a lot yeah I've, I've really... thought about it non-stop watching the show did you? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Admittedly, I mostly wanted to follow Tour de France Loki. Right. I want to know what that guy's story is. <laughs> yeah, me too. And they showed me, I was like, wow. That's I hope real... I hope his dad's finally proud of him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he got the jersey. Um, yeah, I don't, I have to always think, I mean, I, I, in part, I think, wondering about the other things I might have done if I hadn't been an actor probably feeds itself into the work. Um, I mean, it, it, even um, it, even Will Ransom at, at one point, and it's, I think this is a direct quote from the book. He's he there. He's taking Cora on a walk to look at fossils on the edge of the cliff where there's been an earthquake, and she's curious about what he's doing in this. What she sees as a kind of a, a backwater because he's quite an educated man, and and he's talking about how his family had wanted him to be occupy a safe seat in government um, where he may have been able to have influence arguing some minor point of law, but he feels happier here in Essex on, on the edge of the coast containing the anxiety of his parishioners. And then he has a great line. What I was looking for, what I wanted was purpose, not achievement. And perhaps that's like something I've been thinking about is like purpose is to have purpose is so restorative. It gives, it gives everything shape in your life. You know, if you have, if you feel that you, your life has purpose and that's what Loki is wrestling with, you know, the glorious purpose that he was, he thought was kind of motivating him has been revealed to be meaningless and fraudulent and, uh, that would be incredibly destabilizing to suddenly realize your life meant nothing. So uh, yeah, I, these are good questions to occupy me. They, they, I find them occupying anyway. I'm smiling not because I'm laughing, but because you literally nailed the part that that has been like bothering me for the last, this is just going to turn into a therapy session once. That's second. okay. No, but yeah. it's like when you finally get all the things you thought you wanted. Yeah. You know, um, and it, which which happened to me in many ways, sure. and then it turned out it it sucked, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> so, didn't add up to it didn't add up to what you thought it was going to. Oh, up to. it was terrible. Yeah, and so like it's always like careful what you wish for, mm -hmm. sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I th I thought of that too. I thought of, um, 
you know, I think we all want to feel useful in our lives. We want to feel we're of use, that, that there is meaning in our in every in every action, big or small, that they add up to something, you know. And so, that, and, and I think that question is it takes some answering across a lifetime, um, for sure. And I've thought about it a lot. Yeah, it's funny because it's like you get everything you want, and then like people were shocked at how easily I walked away from it all. Right. You know, but like I, I love that's what he does. Yeah. Like in that last scene, I I, I was like, I mean, it sounds very silly to say I'm relating to something that you know. Is no, set that's, on, the like, another that's the but point. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's why we make. And of course, it's a story set in another time, but you make stories to speak to now. Right. Otherwise, we're making this story because it's relevant now because it resonates now. Um, it's gut wrenching stuff and watching him watch how his life could have unfolded. Mm. And I know you're just, you're looking at a blank screen. Yeah. Probably it like destroys. Yeah. It's, I, it's, it was moving to do it. It was, um, it felt very, uh, it felt very cathartic. <laughs> um, because of course it's been a huge part of my life. It's been an enormous part of my life. It, being cast as Loki changed the course of my life. Um, that moment is a fork in the road. I can't go back there and, and I don't particularly want to, but it just is, uh, you know, it's, it has been very meaningful. And to get to that point of, of, uh, playing that scene, I remember it was a Friday afternoon. It was about five o'clock. Um, and, uh, so we didn't have long, you know, you just, but I knew what it had to mean and I knew what I wanted it to express. And, um, it was very vulnerable and and open and emotional and felt very cathartic in lots of ways. And I'm going to go from from that be, before I reveal too much. Um, <laughs> that that emotional uh, uh, powder keg to something a little more light and funny. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, but that can I just one more thing on that? The reason I think that was I, mean, I just thought if you pre- presented me with a script where a human being gets to watch his past and also his future and the future has the same echo of familiarity as the past and the future shows the death of beloved family members and your own death which is uh deeply unpleasant and um tragic and sad and violent and destabilizing it would completely unsettle you it would be so strange and so unusual and so you wouldn't have a reference for even how to feel. And the idea that that character is Loki and it's Loki watching all these things and that the audience has actually seen, has a connection to all these memories was completely unique. I've, unlike anything I've ever done. Sorry. All right. No. Yeah. I, to, this, to the lighthearted thing. That's perfect. Okay. So I was thinking, as you know, I've often told you that Marvel films are modern day Shakespeare, big crowd pleasers yes. that are also super thoughtful, grapple with big uh, issues. Um, you're obviously an expert on both Marvel and Shakespeare. So I have a list of 10 names and I want you to tell me if they are from a Shakespeare play. Okay. okay. A Marvel comic, or in some cases, both. Okay. Okay. This is great. This is yes. great. This is great. I love this. Um, and if I mispronounce, I'm probably going to mispronounce you won't. all of I, these names. No, I, I believe in you, Please Janelle. Please correct I me believe if I in do. you. I all believe in you. Um, Florizel. Shakespeare. You know the play too, don't you? Uh, as you like it. Winter's Tale. Winter's Tale. Yes. Oh, that was not part of the quiz. You're okay, good. Okay. 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 Um, Balder the Brave. Uh, Marvel Comics. You know the one. Thor. Very good. Uh, Volumnia and Valeria. Coriolanus. Okay, so that yeah, was, yeah. was <laughs> giving okay. me because I was worried about you. All right. Thank you. Ajax? Uh, Ajax is a Shakespeare. It's Troilus and Cressida. And it's also a Marvel comic. It's a Deadpool villain. It's a Deadpool villain. Yes. Is he in Dead? Is he in? He's in two. He's in I two. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Um, dupe. 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 Now we're getting, now we're getting yes, hard. This is great. This is obscure. Um, I think is a Shakespeare character. It's a Marvel, Marvel character. It is an X-Force. It is an openly bisexual, pansexual green blob. I doubted myself. I should have gone <laughs> with my first instinct. Uh, yeah. What about Doll? Doll is a Shakespearean character from Henry IV, part one. Damn it. Um, Caliban? A Shakespearean character from The Tempest. And 
<laughs> what you can't see, by the way, those listening, is that Janelle is very helpfully raising her eyebrows when I finished my yes. conclusive. Yes, this is great for audio. For <laughs> yeah, me. yeah. Um, uh, and the Marvel, right? Uh, yes, it is an X Men yes. villain. And Zendaya. Okay, get your question. That's just Zendaya. <laughs> <I guess> Zendaya. <laughs> uh, Zendaya no, I... is a Marvel character, uh, Shakespearean heroine, and an icon in her own right. Damn straight. Yeah. Uh, what about the bear? The bear is a Shakespearean character from The Winter's Tale. Very good. There we okay, go. I tried to trick you on that. It's also an Iron Man villain. Oh, yes, really? Yes, Who, but in has it's he a been... woman. It's a shape shifting. Wow. Well, but if it's very obscure, so uh, you actually this is score such a fun game. No, in the high percentile. No, I was like I was like a sort of eighty five percent. The the dupe you, you threw me for a loop with dupe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was very proud to find dupe. Yeah, online. and I'm sure someone listening is going to correct me that it's actually something else. Something else. But in the meantime, um, you're needed. This somewhere. was such a great. Thank you game. so much. Oh, yeah. Janelle, thank you for having me. Of course, truly. anytime. That's Tom Hiddleston, star of Loki, now streaming on Disney Plus, and The Essex Serpent, which premieres May 13 on Apple TV Plus. And that's it for this edition of Variety's Award Circuit Podcast. The Award Circuit Podcast is edited by Drew Griffith, and Michael Schneider is the producer. Be sure to subscribe to the Award Circuit Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you download podcasts. Also, head on over to Variety.com and click on the Award Circuit tab to find the latest Emmy predictions and key races, as well as your daily fix of news, analysis, and reviews. Until next time, for Jazz Tanke, Emily Longaretta, and Clayton Davis, I'm Michael Schneider, and we'll see you on the circuit. Circuit.